reading is from 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, what, that we obey his that we obey his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world, but no one believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is the truth. The gospel reading is from John chapter, vi chapter 15, verses 9 to 17. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. I'd like to say a prayer for the preacher, in fact, for both of the preachers today. Please join me. Lord, as we come to you in the rain that is ever flowing and ever needed on this earth that you created for us, we thank you for Reverend Brown, who has been such an influential and important person in Pastor Terry's life that she was able to call on him in time of need. Thank you for the words that he's about to give to us, and may you put in our hearts the understanding that makes them relevant and meaningful and make us more close to you as a result. We pray for Pastor Terry that she continues in her healing so that she can in the short term return home, but also in the long term know that there is still meaning and purpose in her life wherever she is, whatever she is doing among friends here at church, among friends out in the world. We ask that you bless her and all of us as part of her community to help her heal and be closer to you in the end. In God's name, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Terry would like you to believe that she fell and hurt her knee, and was in the hospital, and now is in rehab. She would like you to believe that, but I found out the truth this week. She actually got a job in retirement and had to start early. She's working for the Biden administration <laughs> as one of his advisors, and she's in a bunker now helping him plan the campaign. So don't, let, don't believe that you know, she's in rehab someplace getting better. I hope you're watching, Terry. That'll teach you for asking me last minute to do stuff. And thank you for your story and for Google. I thought the moral was don't give a mouse a cookie. <laughs> so much mind blown. Oh, mercy. So I, I think if nothing else this week, oh, I do want to give a shout out to my daughter. Hello, Tori. Watching from New York City this morning. Um, 
I think if, if this week teaches us nothing, life can be complicated. But sometimes in the complication of life or in the complicated things we encounter in life, the answer to solve them is really quite simple. I mean, how many of you have heard this, uh, the saying, it's as plain as the nose on your face? I mean, your nose is obvious to everyone else, but it's something that is incredibly difficult for you to see unless you're looking in a mirror because it's too close to you. And sometimes the solutions... Yes, sir. Your eyes are closed. I don't know how you can see it. I mean, I'm, I mean you can kind of see it. What's, what's on the tip of your nose? Why? Proven my point. Thank you. Didn't even have to Google that one. But it is. I mean, even the tip, it's so close you can't see it. And sometimes in life, the answers to our complicated problems are just too close and you can't see them very well. Or it's like the saying, you can't see the forest for the trees. You are so close to the situation, you're so close to the problem, that you only see that one tree that's in front of you, and you don't realize or see the bigger picture of all the other trees that surround it. And sometimes the solutions are so simple, but they're right in front of you, and you just can't see it. Or, or one more example. Gentlemen, I don't know if you've ever run into this. But there are times when I am looking for something and I can't find it, and so I call to Michelle and she walks right to wherever I am looking for something and she finds it immediately and she says, what were you, looking like a man? <laughs> I mean, like, for example, you know, you're at the fridge and you're looking for the mustard and you open the door and you just stand there. <laughs> Michelle, I don't see the mustard. Walks in, grabs it, you're looking like a man. It's just right in front of you. <laughs> that principle that, that the solution is often just plain and as simple as the nose on your face, I think it applies to our relationships. When I, when I work with couples now preparing for marriage, I, I've gotten very blunt the longer I do this. Because, you know, couples come in and they say they're in love and they can't wait for the wedding day and their big party they're going to have. And I always start by saying, you know what, to tell you the truth, I really don't care about your wedding day. I really don't. It's going to be the best wedding that the two of you have ever been in as bride and groom. Guarantee it. At least for the first one. What I really care about is your marriage. And so we spend several um, sessions together just preparing not for the day, I can do a wedding with my eyes closed, not for the day, but for the long-term marriage. And we usually just begin by discussing the deal breakers that couples can run into, particularly if they haven't talked about them. How many kids are you gonna have? Are you gonna have kids? Who's gonna take care of them? Who's gonna handle the budget? Who's gonna handle this, that? Because one of the areas I focus on is conflict resolution easier how to fight fair. So I tell couples, if, you're not, if, you, if you don't fight, you're not ready to get married. I mean, because, you know, marriage is God's reality show. Let's take two people from com two completely different backgrounds and put them in a house together and see what happens. One illustration I find for conflict is um, it's a fishing reel that's just gotten all knotted up, like with a thousand different knots, and it's hard to know where to begin. Do you untangle each individual knot, or do you just cut the line and move on? And so I usually, when talking with couples, I look for that simple solution that most conflicts are caused by one of two things. They're either caused by a breakdown in communication or a breakdown in commitment. And if you can deal with that, I think you can move towards a resolution. You can move towards forgiveness. And so that principle, I also think, applies to our Christian faith. I mean, so many people that I encounter nowadays, they're looking for their purpose. They're looking for the reason for, for living. What does God want, them, want from them? Or, or how do we live as a follower of Jesus? And I found that the answer to that question of what is my purpose in life is really simple. It's as simple and plain as the nose in your face. Really, 
the reason we're here on this earth is to love God and to love others. That's it. Love others and love God. Simple. And that's the focus of both of our readings today. And both were written by the Apostle John. We first heard from John's letter. And if you read John's letter in its entirety, one thing you'll learn is that John just wrote about love. Love is the hallmark. Love is the purpose for our lives. Love is our identity as believers. And we love God, or at least we should love God above all else. But if that love doesn't spill over into loving other people, then the claim to love God is a hollow claim. That if we don't love other people, then we really don't love God. And that's it. No love for others, no love for God, period, end of discussion. Don't argue. It's just it. And these, these verses from John, the first letter to John, chapter 5, expands that emphasis a bit, reminding us that this love also leads us to obedience. And it's obedience to what Jesus commanded us to do. Now, John's really a little vague here. He doesn't say in the letter, well, what are those com- things that Jesus commanded us to do? So we flip back to John's gospel, particularly verse 12 in chapter 15, when John writes, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus doesn't mince any words. Love one another as I have loved you. I call that the titanium rule. How many of you are familiar with the golden rule? How many of you are familiar enough with the golden rule that you know what it is? It's found in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. The NRSV says, and everything do to others as you would have them do to you. Most people remember it as do unto others as you would have them do unto you. How many of you are familiar with the platinum rule? No? Oh, man. What are they teaching today? Platinum rule is found in Matthew 22, verse 39. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I don't like any of these rules. I don't like these rules because who's at the center of both of them? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Puts me at the center. Oh, I like that. Or you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Who's it put at the center? Me. Again, I like that, but really that puts our ego at the center because it becomes all about us. And so I look at this titanium rule. Love others not as I would love them because I'm not going to do it well. Love others as God loves them. That puts God at the center. It's as plain as the nose on your face. Yet some want to make the Christian faith complicated. They want to tangle it up like a fishing line with theological conflicts and problems to be solved, Some Christians want to mix it up and tangle it up, but it doesn't really have to be that difficult. We just make it difficult. I mean, let's say, for example, tomorrow morning you were to get up and you were going to read the Bible, like the entire Bible, beginning to end. And you want to do it in a uh, methodical fashion. And so you take the Bible, you break it up into 66 books, That's 1,192 chapters. And let's just say you you read through it at a pretty good pace and you spend five minutes in each chapter. And so you read three chapters a day. That's 92 hours of reading. But if I were to ask you, how do you summarize that? How do you summarize the whole Bible, the 66 books, the 1,189 chapters, the 92 hours of reading? How would you summarize it? Would you start with a tangled uh, story of the Jewish people? Would Would you tangle it up and knot it up with all sorts of different theologies and doctrines? Or would you go to how Jesus summarized the Bible? I think he summarized it in eight words. Love one another as I have loved you. Let me see if I do my math correct. Love one another 
as I have loved you. Yes, eight words. Eight words to summarize 66 books, 1,189 chapters, 92 hours of reading. Eight words. It's that simple. As simple and as plain as the nose on your face. But some Christians aren't satisfied with that. They want to complicate it. I mean, that's nothing new. Even Jesus ran into that. He ran into a a nitpicking lawyer. He approached Jesus and said, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, what does it say in the scripture? And the lawyer says, I shall love the Lord my God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love my neighbor as myself. Jesus says, go and do. But of course, that's the platinum rule and, and the... The, the lawyer just had to push it a little bit and says, well, who is my neighbor? Now he asked that question specifically because he, the lawyer, knew the answer. Because in Judaism, in the law, the neighbor was a fellow Jew or a friend. So basically they could say, love your fellow Jew and you can hate everybody else. And so Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan who was the one who loved Because in Leviticus, God expanded that understanding of who you should love to the non-Jews. When God says in Leviticus that you shall love the stranger, you shall love the alien living in your land. In other words, you shall love all people. But we try to complicate it. When we try to define the word all, or we try to define the word love, we try to make it more Difficult, but listen again to the key lines from John 15. As God the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, and as I have loved you, love one another. I think we're called to focus on those words, as I have loved you, so love one another. As I have loved you. How has Jesus loved us? How has Jesus loved the world? I think Jesus' finest hour of love, the moment I believe that the love of God shone most clearly through him was when he hung on the cross. And when he looked at, out at those who had nailed him to that cross, as he looked out to those who were taunting him, what I believe with compassion in his eyes, and he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. In that moment, Jesus showed love in the most tangible and repeatable way. Now, most of us look at the crucifixion and we say, well, we can't do that. I I can't die on a cross. I can't do what Jesus did. But we can love and forgive as Jesus did. I mean, when those around you have created great pain in you, have a heart of love. When those around you have caused you to want to get even, love them as Jesus has loved you. It's as plain as the nose on your face. I was having a conversation about this with someone recently, and they told me we should love people in a way that they get it, that there's no confusion, that they know they've been loved. This type of tangible love is all about loving someone, whether they meet our approval or not. I remember one of the... uh, challenging days of my young adult life when I thought things were so simple became complicated when one of my older brothers came out. And I was struggling because it had gone against what I was taught in college. It was going against what I had believed up to that point. And and someone told me then, and people still tell me today, well, the best thing I could do, the most loving thing would be to, be, to push him away. That's the best way to honor God, I've been told. And and I have to tell him, I don't think that. I mean, one of the most loving things I can do is to love my brother because he is family. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing new, nothing different. So if you remember nothing else this morning, remember this. As God the Father has loved Jesus, in the same way, love others. As God... As Jesus said, as God my Father has loved me, love each other. So tomorrow morning I will pick up my Bible as I am wont to do in the morning. And I'm not reading through all 66 books, all 1,189 chapters, not 92 hours of reading this year. I've done that. But I really don't have to. 
I just have to remember the eight simple words. Love one another as I have loved you. We are called to follow Jesus. We're called to live gospel-shaped lives. It should be seen in the way we behave. It should be seen in how we talk. It should be seen in how we love. So tomorrow morning, when you wake up, and as hard as you try to see the tip of your nose with your own eyes, good luck. But when you look in the mirror, and you see that beautiful schnoz looking back at you, remember that God loves the person you see in the mirror. And when you look at someone else, particularly the person, and you know who it is, who grinds on that last nerve, remind yourself that God loves them just as much as God loves the person I saw in the mirror that morning. So if God loves them that much, then we can try to find something to love about them as well. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the remarkable gifts of your creating and redeeming love, the love that casts out all fear. We give you thanks for the love that frees us to ask questions and explore, to frame doubts and investigate new possibilities, to build theories and then cross-examine them. We give you thanks for the love that enables us to marvel at our own existence, to ponder and remember, recognize our own needs and affirm our own knowledge and purpose. We give you thanks for the love that helps us to communicate with one another, to express trust and respect, share heartaches and visions, to convey love and mercy. We give you thanks for the love that inspires us to warmly encourage those around us to affirm and build up, to comfort and enlighten. We give you thanks for the love that liberates us to celebrate the world around us in poetry and song, to delight in shapes and colors, intricacies and patterns, awesome forces and deep mysteries. Above all else, we thank you for the love that allows us to admit that we have no words in which to adequately describe the process of faith in Christ, the awesome worship of our God and the holy wonder of the Spirit. We thank you for that point where our love becomes wordless adoration. We pray this through Christ Jesus, who is the pure glory of your love. Amen.